Unit two, economics, day five types of economies, your learning goal, end of the lesson. You should be able to compare and contrast different types of economies. So you should know the different economies and then be able to list the differences. Identify how they differ. So what is an economy? Often when I ask a student that, there's just a blank space in your brain right now. It's hard to visualize. What is an economy? What's in your brain is probably not much different than this slide. So let's fill in this slide and fill in the slide in your mind. All right, so you got this blank space. Well, it's an imaginary land. And so let's populate this imaginary land, this space with households, people. So now you're visualizing some blank space, but people are living there. So there's households popping up all over. You see households and people, and those people shop. They consume goods. They consume resources. They consume food. They purchase things. They need things to survive. What you're seeing develop maybe is what's starting to look like a little town. And inside this little town, now we're popping up with firms, which are factories producing goods from resources, which are stores that are then selling these goods to the consumers. So in your mind, you see all these houses and stores popping up. This is an economy. People are shopping, buying, living, making decisions every day about what to produce, sell. And we've got workers in there making decisions, where to work, how to work and owners deciding how much to pay those workers and whether they want to take out a loan to open up more firms. And more firms are popping up and they're taking out loans. And that's leading to more stores popping up and more households popping up. Now we've got households and firms and businesses and got a little bustling city in your mind. That is an economy. And in that economy, we have goods that are getting sold. We have goods that are getting produced. We have machines and equipment and cars producing those goods. And they're producing those goods by using the land. So now you're seeing land and resources in your mind and how those resources are used and how the machinery works to produce goods to serve the households. And now all of a sudden we're feeding nations and more households are popping up. And we're producing brand new goods and firms are coming up and people are taking out more loans and investing and making decisions about saving and borrowing, where to work, how to work, what to make. And then also overseeing these stores and factories and households and the people and their property and the resources of the nation. There's a government overseeing it. And they pass laws about the economy. They pass laws which are rules about the factories and the households. And government agencies then pop up that then enforce and regulate, and create these rules and watch the factories and watch the households and watch the stores and protect the resources or not protect the resources and evaluate the equipment and the safety standards. And the list goes on and on with the rules and the regulations of which the government oversees this city. And then there's also banks loaning money that leads to more firms popping up, more households popping up, borrowing to build houses and more workers. And they're spending money and the money's flowing through the economy. And people are going to work and people are going to the store and they're going to Walmart. And Walmart is a tiny example of a mini economy. Walking through Walmart, consumers are making decisions about what to purchase. Prices are going up, prices are going down. Workers are being productive, stocking shelves and cashing you out and receiving paychecks for their job. And business owners are deciding what to do with that store, whether to expand, how to treat their employees. And the government's regulating all the decisions that are being made. That's an economy. Tons of parts moving around, a mini city, a nation. The world has an economy, but within the world, we have economies that differ, economies that have different rules, economies that have different philosophies. And those economies fall along a spectrum, two extremes, high, low, hot, cold, however you want to see it. But we want to look at the exaggerated versions of these economies. And what are we exaggerating? We're looking at the role of the government in regulating and overseeing that economy. That is the major difference between the different world economies. Some economies have a lot of government involvement. The government oversees every aspect of that economy from production to consumption. Yes, that's right, consumption. Even what you consume and buy and sell, the government is deciding what you buy. Now this is the extreme version. But in the extreme type of economy we call command, the government commands everything. They are in control of everything. It is centrally planned. The government agencies get together in their rooms 
and they look at everything and they make the decisions and the decisions that they make are the decisions that must be followed by the producers. The factory is run by the government. They decide who to hire, what to fire, the government does. They decide what products to make and how to make them. The government agencies work all that out, not private individuals. That's command, that's centrally planned, that's communism. Cuba is not that extreme, but Cuba does have heavy regulation and decides what goods will be produced, what type of car will be produced. They control the car factory. They control what medications will be produced and what won't be produced. They design it all. On the other side, we have an economy that has very little government involvement. We call this a free economy, a free market economy, a market or an economy free from government involvement, free of government control, free of government coercion. You are free as in independent, not free as in free stuff, but free, independent to make decisions. And although Australia is not as much of an example anymore, we'll still list it just for a benchmark reference point. But once upon a time in the land of Australia, the government wasn't very much involved in what goods were being bought and sold, what go goods were being produced, or how the consumer could spend their money, how you, the individual, could make choices. They had other things to do. And then we have where most economies fall, somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, a mixture of government involvement. There are situations where the government is very much involved and sometimes their government's hands off. In a free economy, you win or lose, it's up to you. The government's not going to jump in and save the day. You gamble all your money away. You're poor, living on the street. That was your choice. You were free to make that choice, live with that choice. In a mixture, a mixed economy, the government often will intervene at that point. And so it's an example of, yeah, you're free to make a lot of choices. And so the government's not involved. Yeah, you gambled all your money away. You're free to make that choice. But at the same time, we feel that we have an obligation to A, help you out, but B, if we don't help you out, maybe you turn to a life of crime. They, the government, evaluate all the possibilities. And in most cases, when people are down and out and struggling, the government gets involved. They don't get involved in a free, but in a mixed economy, sometimes they let you do your thing, sometimes they help you out. USA is an example of that. And we, go back and forth on the spectrum, depending on who was running the administration and the government at the time. Sometimes we're more free, sometimes we're more command. And get closer to socialism, which is on your way to communism, as you travel left on the spectrum. So let's look at the differences. And we're gonna look at extremes, and then we'll go into the mixed. Command versus free on the extremes, a command has massive, almost 100% government involvement in every aspect of your life. It's hard to visualize that. It's very hard. And we're talking about everything from your household to where you live, to what you purchase, to what businesses do and create. It's probably hard in your mind to really envision where government is absolutely controlling everything, setting all the rules, making all the decisions. Really difficult. But that is what's happening. Every household does not make the choices. The government makes the choices for you. They decide what groceries you have. They decide what you're eating for dinner on Monday night. They decide the clothes that you're going to wear. They decide the television programming that is available. And even if they decide that you get three channels instead of 300, they then decide what channel you watch and what channel and when you watch it. That's the extreme version. Now, some of those choices, as we go to the right side, from extreme command. So maybe you get your own choice of what channel to watch. But even in some communist economies that we've seen, the government pretty much controls the channel. So, all right, we'll let you pick between channel one, channel two, channel three, which we've all pretty much control. So there's really not even a difference between channel one, channel two, and channel three. So that might be hard to visualize, but you kind of can if you start with the idea of think about school. In America, it's a mini example, mini is a tiny example of a command economy, of communism. 
you do not even get to pick to go to school. You go to school. You go to school for 13 years because they decided it. You go to the teacher that they decided. You go to the periods that they decided in the order that they decided. You study the subjects that they decided. You eat the lunch that they handpicked for you. You get the portions that they controlled for you. You get what they believe was the healthiest. You run on their schedule. They control the time. They tell you when to get up and to go to the next class, when to sit down and go to the next class. So if you take that idea and then you just expand it to businesses, imagine the government then just setting all the rules and training everybody at a factory. Same thing. Now, the free economy has little government involvement. They're not involved. Pretty simple. They let you, the consumer, work with the business owner. They let you, the consumer, work with the producer. You can choose to work where you want. They can choose to fire you. You can win and get super rich and keep all your money. You can lose it all. They're not really worried about it. They're maybe just maybe fighting crime, putting out fires, maybe running the schools a little bit. But, you know, the decisions that you're making every day, they don't care. The decision business owners are making every day, they don't care. Leave us out of it. That market is free of government involvement. Going further to that point, differences. Again, in a command, government makes all the decisions. In a completely free, you choose. You want to wear nothing but flip-flops? You want to be a flip-flop guy? Like Every day, you're just that guy that wears flip-flops. You can go to the store, buy as many flip-flops as you want, and do that every day. You are free in free market. You may not be smart. You may get frostbite in the winter because you want to be the flip-flop guy. But you are free to make that choice. And when your toes fall off, the government's not going to be there to intervene. The government didn't stop you for making the choice to be flip-flop guy. Now, over in a command economy, extreme example, but they worry that you may choose to be flip-flop guy. They don't trust the people. They don't trust the people to make wise decisions. They don't trust the people to make the most efficient, beneficial decisions. They don't think people are going to make decisions that are good for everyone. They think people could be too greedy, could hoard all the cash, people could abuse, or people could just simply lose. And what they decide is we're going to make all the decisions so that there are no losers and it's all winners. And if that means I can't let you be flip-flop guy because you might make a stupid choice and lose your toes and then be unable to work and then really be a drag on society, what we'll do is we'll decide what shoes you wear. Simple, easy. How about that? Kind of sounds like school uniforms a little bit. They decide everything because they want to serve everyone. And they think they can make better decisions and create a society where everything is good. All the decisions, like we talked about before. That's extreme. Never really get there. But there have been times in society where we've flirted with getting pretty close. And even in America, many think that we are sliding a little too far to the red left side with government making more and more of our decisions. Being more and more involved and taking the freedom of choice away from consumers and producers. Again, comparing and contrasting economies, a command economy, like we have already said, if they're involved in every aspect, if they make all decisions, then they're also going to own every piece of land. Whereas in a free market, there's private property and there's very little government involvement. The government does not give out free apartments. The government does not even get involved in giving you loans to buy property. You want to buy land, go buy land. You want to sell your land, go sell your land. Do whatever you want with your land. You want to build a farm in the middle of the city? Go for it. You want to put a kennel in your backyard with 40 dogs? It doesn't matter if your neighbors don't like it or not. You're free to make that choice. Barking in cages all night, driving the neighborhood crazy, whatever. Guess what, neighbor? You can move. You're free to make that decision. Private property, your property. You do what you want with it. You raise whatever you want in your farm. You farm the acreage that you want to farm. You make all the decisions. And you do and you die by that. You live and you lose by that. And if you have a bad harvest in that economy, a market completely free, government involvement, bad harvest, there will not be the government to come in and save the day. Now, over in a command economy, a controlled, a 
centrally planned economy. They have centrally planned the land. They own everything. So they own all the housing and they build all the housing in the most efficient way, in the cheapest way. And they assign you to your house. You don't own it. But guess what? Well, you know, when things fall apart, I don't have to fix anything because it's the government's property. Yeah, we'll see how that worked out. But in theory, yeah, if your toilet's clogged, you don't have to pay for a plumber because it's not your toilet. It's the government's. So hopefully the government comes and cleans it up if they're good at doing their job. Good luck on that. The housing is completely controlled by the government. You don't buy or sell. Now, you don't have to worry about buying a house. You get a house. Oh, cool. Now, when you give everybody a house, you think everybody gets the best house? Everybody gets the same house. Everyone gets the same space. You want a mansion? No mansions in a command economy. The government doesn't have the time, the space, the resources to give everybody a mansion. You're not even going to have a man cave. You'd be lucky to have a two-bed, one-bath because the government doesn't have a bunch of money, and they don't want to spend all of it on housing. They've got other things to spend on. They need to make sure that the economy is as efficient and productive as possible. You don't need all that space. You don't need it in a free market, but if you earn it, you can build the biggest house you want. In a market free of the government, you want to build a castle? The government doesn't care. Build a castle. But over command, centrally planned, the government owns the land. They tell the farmer, guess what? You don't own the land. We own the land. We decide what crops to grow. Yeah, but I'm the farmer and I'm actually a, a guy that knows agro and I know what to plant, when to plant it and how to plant it. Shut up, farmer. This is a centrally planned economy. You're growing corn in December. I don't know if that's such a good idea. I am a farmer. Maybe you should let me make the decisions. No, we command and we demand what you should do and how you use it. And oh, by the way, there's too much corn on the market. So you gotta burn your field down and you're not using that acreage for two years. Okay, why would we do that? It's too much corn. Prices are going down. So these things all kind of happen. In a command economy, it's not driven by profits. A free market economy, it's completely driven by profits. The decisions you make as a consumer to save or spend, it's all about having more money in the end or more goods in the end, or more resources. When you make decisions as a consumer, purchasing goods, buying, saving, you buy things that you think are gonna make your life better, which while that's not a profit in terms of money, but it is a profit to you, or you save your money, which yes, to accumulate money. So you're either accumulating money, making money, working, saving, or you're accumulating resources, you're spending that money to buy goods, which also have value, which in a form is money. And then we also have businesses in that market that's free of government involvement. And their whole reason of making any good, whether it's a prescription drug or a fast car, the reason that they designed, built, and sold that was to make money. Ford doesn't make Mustangs to make you happy. Ford doesn't make Mustangs because they look cool. Ford made the Mustang to make money. Pharmaceutical companies don't necessarily create new drugs to save the world. Maybe they do, but the reason they do it and the reason they spend billions of dollars in research and with machines and equipment is to make money. It's profit driven. Over the command economy, there is no money. There's no profit. The government owns everything. You just show up to work. You go to work, you go home, and then the government divides all the resources. They're making all the decisions. They're making all the choices. Well, how would I feed my family? The government provides the food for you. They provide the meals for you, an extreme command economy. As long as you show up and you're productive every day, you get a house. You get your food. We'll give you the clothes. We pick out the clothes. We do all those things, and we make sure that everybody gets treated equally. The government owns all the resources of the nation and then divides those resources among the people. They do everything. And so when you go to work and the business is being created, the businesses are actually to serve the people. You don't have pharmaceutical companies inventing new drugs simply for making money. They would only make drugs that are helpful to the society. You wouldn't make a Ford Mustang 
You'd make a more cost-effective car that's efficient and doesn't use any fuel. And it's very simple and it's cheap to make so that everyone can get a car. You don't try to make the fastest, most fancy car to sell for the highest price. You don't care about profit. You just care about efficiency and serving the needs of the people. And there's problems when we take away competition, as you find out, or well, we'll get to the next step. So when you have no profits, you have no competition. The government doesn't compete against the government. There's just one car. Imagine a little tiny sedan, a little coupe, a four door for the family. You don't need all that car. You don't need a giant SUV, four door, five seats, squeeze it in. That's where everyone gets the one government car, the one government meal, the one government jacket that everyone wears, and the government pants, very much like we wear in school. So there's no competition. Everybody just gets the same thing. And so there isn't a McDonald's competing against Burger King. There's just one place. And they're not worried about competition. They're not worried about making a profit. Their job is just to hand out the food. Their job is just to make the car. They don't have to compete with other car places. Just show up to work, make the goods. The bosses just make sure that everything is getting made. No one is worried about sales. Over in a free market, we have competition. Like, well, I kind of like not having to compete. Well, the problem with not having competition is competition forces you to work harder. Competition forces you to improve quality. Competition forces you to find new strategies. You're pushed in school if you compete, in sports if you compete against others. It pushes you to better lengths. Without competition, there's no push. Do you work as hard in a factory with no competition? Do you work as hard in life when you know that you don't have to make any decisions about what clothes to buy, when to save, where to live? Are you as productive? Do you come up with any new inventions when you know there's no new invention that really matters because the government controls the inventions and decides what we need? In a market free of government involvement, you win or lose on your own. You compete against others as a consumer to buy goods. You compete with others as a worker to get jobs. Businesses compete from McDonald's to Taco Bell. And in that competition, prices go up, they go down. New things are invented. Quality increases. Speed of service increases. New cars are built every day, more efficient, faster, more reliable, more durable. And there are many opportunities to choose between many different models of vehicles. And you can live wherever you want and compete for housing. And all this revolves around the idea of consumer sovereignty. Consumer, you, the person who purchases things, have power. Sovereignty, fancy word for power. The consumer decides with their money what's going to be invented. We want smartphones in our pockets. We want them faster. We want them cooler. That is the power that you have. That is the demand that you have. And competition then fires up. And Samsung and Apple respond to your power. And we invent new things. And we make better quality goods. And the government just stays out of the way and lets the machine work. Let the people and the businesses do their thing. Let them go back and forth. And as they go back and forth, the consumer says, we want this, we don't want that. And it directs businesses in a direction of what will be produced and made. In a command economy, you don't have consumer sovereignty. You have government sovereignty. The government decides if they're even going to have smartphones. Then when you do, there's just one smartphone. Sorry, guys. Everybody's getting a droid. Wah, wah. And even on that droid, the government is going to control what you can look up and what you can't look up. And they're going to control all the content on that droid. That's an extreme example. But as you go for the right, the government gets involved. And they make the decisions of what's going to be made, what's necessary. And often it's going to be a matter of them dividing resources and deciding, well, that's frivolous. They don't make trident gum in a command economy. You don't even need gum. We're getting rid of gum. It's not going to be produced. We're not going to devote an entire factory to the production of gum. We need to devote an entire factory to the, the production of cancer drugs. That would be the decision the government makes. They make it. It is government sovereignty. Consumer sovereignty is in the free market. If your economy is healthy and doesn't desire cancer drugs, then they won't be made. And if your society is completely free and obese and overweight 
and struggling and they demand a solution, then the pharmaceutical company comes up with a Ozempic, which allows people to lose weight. And that's simply a response to consumer sovereignty. Examples, North Korea and Cuba are the closest that we get to a command, centrally planned, controlled economy today, where the government is in everything. Australia may not be the best representation anymore. Singapore might be a, bit, a little bit better, but either way, just throwing it out as a benchmark, an example of an economy that's pretty free. Now we're going to close out with the mixed economy. Mixture of both. This is where we see both government and individuals operating in this space, in between these households, factories in your mind. And it is also the most prevalent type of economy on planet Earth, throughout America, the Americas, Europe, Africa. We have economies that are mixed. Now in a mixed economy, it's a little free and it's a little command. It's somewhere in between and it varies. It depends on the situation. Let's talk about those situations. So there is a private sector in the mixed economy. In the private, private property, private as in leave me alone government, give me my privacy, the individual gets to choose, the individual is profit driven, the individual competes, households compete, firms compete, they want to make profit, consumer sovereignty drives the interaction between selling and buying and making choices, you're free. We call that the private sector, mainly your house, although you're not completely free in your household. At the store, you pick out what you want, although a lot of the things at the store are regulated. You grab the bag of Cheetos or the box of Cheetos. You made the choice to buy the Cheetos or you made the choice to buy the Cheez-Its. But then you look on the back of the box and there's all this labeling because the government stepped in a little bit and said, well, let's make sure they know exactly what's in this Cheez-It. There is also a public sector where the government is much, much more involved. The private sector, not completely free, but pretty free. You make some choices. Friday night, you're living out in that private sector, deciding what stores to go to. Government doesn't decide. You're staying out as late as you want. Government doesn't decide. Maybe you're working late because you decided to. Everybody's working for the weekend. Government didn't make decide you need to go home now. Or the government didn't decide you got to stay out late. You're working late. And the government doesn't decide your pay. Sometimes they do. A little bit. Right? Minimum wage. So a lot of freedom out there, but a little bit of command. Now in the public sector, this is where parts of our economy completely controlled. Let's go to the extreme, like schools, completely controlled by the government. All the decisions made in school, government's doing it. And you're not free to choose what subject you want for the most part, or what you're going to study today, or when the quiz is going to be. All that, you didn't get to pick the topics. You didn't get to pick the grades that you go through. You didn't get to pick the tests that you have to take to graduate. All that was picked. All those questions were selected by the government. So we do have command in certain sectors of the economy. Schools are one of the sectors in that economy in your mind, in a mixed economy where the government is heavily involved. The United States of America is an example of this. So again, a mixed economy, Invasion, it's easiest to imagine just certain geographical places or different locations. Imagine yourself, you're in a store, you're living in that private sector making most of the decisions, driven by profit, having to compete against workers, and also having to compete your business against others. That's the free part of it. Now then travel over to the school, you're now located in something that's more government regulated. Maybe you go to a hospital and you get to make decisions about what kind of care you receive, but then some hospitals like Veterans Affairs, 
the government is very much in control of that hospital. So you get situations and locations where all government, no government, little bit of freedom with a little dash of government, that is a mixed economy, that is the United States. You should now be able to compare and contrast the different types of economies. Just look at them on the extremes. The command, centrally planned, communism, government commands everything, controls everything. And then on the opposite end, a free market where the market is free of that government involvement. 